Hey there, welcome back. If you remember from previous videos, this is my Atari ST that I've owned since I was a kid. In this video series, what I'm doing is various upgrades that I could never manage back then. They were either too expensive or they just didn't exist. In today's video, I'm going to be showing you how I upgraded the RAM from its stock half megabyte to a full four megabytes. Something that was way beyond my reach as a kid. I mean, a 14 year old kid with four megabytes in their computer? That just didn't happen. Along the way, I'll also show you some of the problems I encountered and some future expansions that I want to do to the computer. So, let's get on with it. Here's the inside of my ST. As you can see, there's quite a lot of wires inside here. None of them look like they're supposed to be there. I've had two upgrades done to this machine. One is a TOS upgrade. The other one that we're looking at today is this RAM upgrade. This particular upgrade was quite popular. It was one of the more higher end expensive ones. It's made by a company called Marpet. And what it tries to do is replicate the STE's way of having SIM sockets and put them in an STFM. So to do this, a certain amount of hackery has to happen. The chip underneath this board is called the MMU, or the Memory Management Unit. It's the main chip that drives and keeps the RAM stable in an ST. And as such, it's got some connections that you need and various signals on the memory bus. The MMU is normally in a socket. And what you're normally supposed to do is take that small upgrade board and just push it into the socket around the chip. However, my ST has an MMU that's surface mounted. So what this meant is that the person installing this had to solder the board on the top. The chip inside this metal can is called the video shifter and it's responsible for generating the ST's video signal. For reasons I don't quite understand, this is also a good point on the motherboard to tap into some important signals. You'll notice none of this upgrade has anything to do with the CPU. The final component of the upgrade is the SIM board itself, which is where we put our memory. So let's just look at why you'd even want to upgrade the RAM in a machine that clearly isn't designed for it. Surely if Atari made it with half a meg of RAM, that's all you needed. Why did the first thing people do with their new ST is start looking for memory upgrades and at least upgrade the thing to one meg? Why am I even trying to upgrade it to four? Surely that's just an overkill. Am I going to actually see any benefit? Will I be able to do anything better? If you're trying to use this as a more professional computer, then that professional software, like a sound editing program or DTP, that kind of software benefited from more memory. So as you might have noticed, this RAM upgrade is part of a bigger journey that I'm going on with my computer. I started off by just looking at the thing and then fixing its power supply. And now we're on to doing some RAM upgrades. Now, yes, I could just stick some Sims in, be done, two second video. However, what I'm using this as is a way to improve my own skills so instead of just going on the internet and getting some sims, what I thought I'd do is build my own actual sims from scratch. And what that meant is I needed to learn how to do surface mount soldering. I've done a lot of through hole soldering, so this is the next level up in my soldering skills. To do this though, I don't just want to start soldering the sims directly. If I break them or burn them up or something, then I'm stuck. So what I did was I bought some practice boards off eBay and after quite a lot of fiddling about and just learning how to manipulate things that I can barely see, I think I got the feel for how surface mount soldering works and some of the little techniques for dealing with such small devices and how much solder you need to put on. Um, I also learned that a microscope, while you see lots of people using them, if you're not that used to the whole process, it's just a thing that gets in the way. And what I also didn't appreciate is just how hot everything gets. If you're blowing hot air on things, everything heats up and it gets really uncomfortable. So learning this stuff is also something I need to do for another upgrade that I'm going to add. I've got the ACSI to SD adapter and that's got a really small pitch chip on it that I need to solder and have it working first time. So I'm kind of building myself up to this. Because I'm building Sims literally from scratch, I need to know if they work. Like. Have I built them correctly? Are they soldered right? Now, the ST doesn't really have any way of telling me things about its memory. I've got TOS 2.6, and when you put memory in 
That does a memory count and tells you how much it thinks is in there. And it looks like it's doing a memory check. It's probably good enough for just testing memory that was probably working last time you turned it off. But I need something a little bit more robust. So what I've done is I've gone and found this diagnostics cartridge. And this has got several tests on it. And I'll do this later on. So let's go back to doing the actual RAM upgrade. So we have a RAM upgrade that takes Sims. So we need Sims for it. Now, if we go back to the 90s, as a kid, I saw adverts for this upgrade board and the Sims itself. The Sims were tiny. Like, I didn't appreciate just how small these things were until I actually got some. And they were really expensive. So to me, this was almost like futuristic magic. Well, if you jump ahead 30 years, you can now go on GitHub. You can download PCB design files for Sims. You can then send them off to your favorite PCB manufacturer. And after a week or so on a little journey from China, you have some PCBs that look very much like Sims. And then you just need some RAM chips. It's really cool how like this has progressed. How once something that I could have only ever bought from a proper factory that made them in mass, I can now just make myself in my shed using some things that I've bought off the internet. As you can see though, it's quite fiddly getting these things built. And you'll realize in a bit that these things don't quite go to plan. My idea in my head that seemed quite straight off and easy was to get the PCBs made. Then I just find some RAM chips off eBay and put the two together. Job done, I've got some Sims. Well, the Sims themselves didn't come with any build instructions. So I kind of had to figure that bit out myself, like what chips I needed and which way around they go and everything. So I got the two Sims I already owned and looked at them and figured out what RAM chips I thought I needed. Then I went hunting on eBay and I found some 72 pin Sims that looked like they had the correct chips. You know, eBay is full of 72 pin Sims if you go looking. There aren't so many 30 pin Sims. So I figured all I needed to do was get the 72 pin sim, my hot air gun, desolder the chips and put them on the new sims that I've had made. And that's where I had to learn about putting on different amounts of solder paste and figuring out how to take a chip off. Like it takes a lot of hot air and time to remove these chips and then making sure I've got them sat on the pads properly. There's no holes to align everything. While you might see videos of people surface mount soldering and the things just magically slide into place. That doesn't seem to happen with bigger, heavier chips. They just sit where they are, the solder melts, and that's where they're staying. So I've built my Sims. I have two of them. Will they work? That's the thing to find out. I got my Sims that I freshly made. I put them in the machine. I switched the machine on. Now, while there was a Thankful lack of magic smoke coming out of anything. My ST didn't really seem like I'd done anything to it. As in it came on, it did a memory test and told me it had half a megabyte. Which is not correct. It should have at least said two and a half. I've built what I thought was two one meg sims. I've put them in where the existing one meg sims were. It should have just been like it was before. I tried various combinations of these new sims and the existing ones swapping them in and out, but it just didn't seem to work. Looking at the PCBs, they looked the right size and shape, or the pads seemed to line up. The chips were completely soldered. I did some basic beeping out with my multimeter and everything seemed soldered down. Just both sims didn't work at all. The only things I can conclude are either that something's not quite right with this PCB or that the donor sim I bought didn't work. I had no way of testing it before taking it to bits. Or that maybe it has the wrong RAM chips and there's some fundamental problem that I'm just not understanding here. Another one is that maybe I cooked these chips whilst trying to remove them. I don't know how long these chips can withstand being blasted with hot air. I figure it must be a while though because they normally reflowed in an oven which heats up and then cools down and takes a while to do this. So maybe I did it too fast, I don't know. I've seen videos of people making devices on the internet with surface mount, and while they're all sped up like 50 times, 
It still seems to take a while to heat up a chip for it to solder. It just seems really strange that both of them didn't work. But anyway, onwards. Remember how I was talking about eBay? And how back in the day you couldn't just buy sims off eBay for a tenner? Well today you can. So that's what I did. I figured I'd rather make my ST work and have 4 megabytes than go down the rabbit hole of testing DRAM and working out why it was broken. That might be a thing for the future. So I had a look on eBay, and as it happens, someone was selling a pair of what they thought was 1 meg sims for a pretty reasonable price. So what this means is I now have 4 1 meg sims, and also that 512k on board. And that's something we're now going to have to deal with. This is where the easy bit of sticking sims in a board and switching the machine on requires a bit more brain surgery to make it be 4 meg. The ST, you see, is configured with two banks of RAM and the Marpet board has four slots. That's two slots per bank. Well, fortunately, with some minor brain surgery, we can temporarily lobotomize my ST to switch off its onboard RAM. Now, don't you just love the internet? This is the manual that came with this Marpet RAM board. It's a thin photocopied leaflet that is a couple of pages long, folded in half and stapled in a corner. The kind of thing you got in the box, you read it once, you did your RAM upgrade, and then you forgot about it and probably binned the box. But just like there's people like us that enjoy kind of taking these computers to bits and documenting how we make them work, there are also people out there who enjoy documenting just everything they can get their hands on. So someone obviously got this manual, scanned it in, and I can now use it. So according to these instructions, what I need to do first is work out what type of board I've got so I can cut some resistors. This will sever the connection between the MMU and the onboard RAM. I don't quite know exactly how it works, but we have to f then feed 5 volts into the resistors. Which, after poking them with my multimeter, I can see that they connect to one of the legs on the DRAM chips. So it's probably some sort of chip enable line. That if you pull it low it enables the chip so if we put 5 volts in it will pull it high and switch the chip off that's my logic now they're very specific about these boards because it depends which resistors you're cutting they're all numbered the same thing but I guess over different revisions things have moved around it seems I have a type 1 board according to the images which are very badly photocopied so I need to cut these two resistors and then wire their ends to the big capacitor that's at the side of the motherboard. I'll try and do a neater job than whoever installed my TOS upgrade. The wires can go underneath this socket and be neatly out the way. So here's the final upgrade with four 1 meg sims and the onboard RAM disabled. Kinda need to test it now. I've just chopped bits off my ST. I know I can solder them back on if they don't work, but still this bit feels a bit final chopping something off. Going back to doing RAM upgrades in general, something I want to try with my ST once it's been fully upgraded is a replacement desktop, maybe even a replacement operating system. The ST is known for its glorious green desktop. How could you not like that thing? It's just pure green shining out your TV. However, unless you upgrade to TOS 2.6, the desktop is pretty limited it's nowhere near as functional as the Mac System 7, for example. I mean, you can't even drag a rubber band box up and to the left on the screen. It only goes down and to the right. You can't really organize the icons very well. And the windows behave very sort of strangely if you're used to modern computers. A lot of that was fixed in TOS 2.6. Talking of operating systems though, there is also a Unix-like operating system called Mint, which later would actually become Multitos, which was part of the Falcon's operating system. And that is a whole video in itself. So that definitely benefits from having more RAM and more than a single 720k floppy disk. These are things I want to experiment with because back when I owned this computer, I couldn't really do that. My machine wasn't good enough. Now talking of professional uses for the machine, the ST's screen resolution 
was either a really small 320 by 200 or that weird squashed 640 by 200 medium resolution on a regular TV, because that's all a TV could actually display. It couldn't do much better. But trying to use that resolution for anything more serious than playing games or drawing pictures was really difficult to get around these low resolutions. What Atari did was they also created a 640x480 high resolution monochrome mode. This also required a special Atari monitor. A PC's VGA monitor can do the same frequency that generates a 640x480 monochrome image. And all you need is a video cable. So I've got the parts for that and I'll build one. Okay, so enough waffling. Let's see if this memory upgrade actually works. Or have I just knackered my ST and Chop the wrong resistors, you know? I don't actually know if this is going to work. So let's flick the switch and see what happens. Well, the machine has turned on. That's a good thing. And there's no magic smoke. And it also looks like Toss has found more than half a meg of RAM. That box across the screen looks bigger. I don't know how much it's discovered. We're going to have to wait for this. Also, will it crash part way through? Well, I think you can see there by my reaction that this has actually worked successfully. Uh, I didn't bother recording any audio for this because I wasn't quite sure how well it would work. It's quite hard recording this stuff. There's a lot of false starts as things don't work or you get stuck or distracted or kind of something doesn't go to plan and you just want to get on and fix the thing rather than film the process of fixing the thing. But it's working. This is awesome. This actually means I now have a four megabyte machine that I can use for anything that the ST can do. So let's just test to check the RAM is actually functional and that it's not just it's counted it, but if we try and write to it, the machine dies. These memory tests take quite a while though, so I'll speed them up. Right, there we go. It's seen all the RAM. The memory checker this time has actually found four megabytes of the stuff. It's not just counted half of it for some weird reason. So there we go. We have a working RAM upgrade. How cool is that? So there we go. We've got a machine with four megabytes of RAM. This is pretty cool. I've wanted this since like, I understood that the machine could have its RAM upgraded. I hope the way I've presented this is also a bit more interesting than just yet another soldering montage. I've tried to explain some of the things I want to use this machine for. Because I know there's a lot of videos of people playing games on like old computers but I want to use it and actually make it do proper things. I also need a working hard disk because some of the programs that I want to run don't work off floppy disk. So in the future, I've got a few more upgrades and then there'll be some time where I'll actually try and use this and show what it was like. So if that's an interesting thing, come back next time. And until then, see you later.